Uh, good afternoon. This is Bobby Burns, Council Member Burns. Uh, we are starting the Administration and Public Works Committee. It is Monday, October 25th. And uh, we have a quorum, but I believe we have a member who is attending online. So can we do a roll call attendance? Yes. Council Member Kelly? Here. Council Member Braithwaite? Here. Council Member Newsma? Here. Council Member Burns? Here. Council Member Reed? Here. Um, so, so that goes to the consent calendar. Looks like he's next up. Uh, we talked about A2, then removed approval of a contract with Tesca Associates for consulting services related to the Evanston Skate Park. Uh, that is a is on for can uh, is a consent item, and that is being pulled for further discussion. Uh, any other items on the consent calendar that should be pulled off? I'm sorry, is the e-scooter discussion uh, a part of the consent calendar? Or am I confusing my committees right now? I'm confusing my committees. Apologies. Okay, and, and, and yes, I was about to say. And A5 is being uh, withheld. That is approval of contracts with Alexander Chemical Corporation. Um, that is being withheld, so we will not discuss that or take any action on that item. So we have A2. Uh, A2 is the only item we'll pull in. Anything else? That's it. I'll okay. move the uh, consent items if you would like. Is there a second? Shall we read them? Second. Do we have to read I them? know you read them. You want to read them? You can go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll move uh, the following items on the consent uh, agenda. Item A1, approval of the City of Evanston payroll and bills list uh, in the amount of $2,874,240.15 and bills lists for October 26th in the amount of $3,930,510.80. That's for action. Uh, item a3, approval of sole source purchase with Microsystems Incorporated. Uh, this is in the dollar amount of $54,500. Funding will come from the Building Inspection Services Software Maintenance Account, uh, of which $21,726 has been uh, spent out of a budget of $150,000. Uh, item A4, approval of sole source contract with Chicago Communications, LLC, for the purchase of 47 truck-mounted two-way radios for the Public Service Bureau. Staff recommends City Council authorize the interim city manager to execute uh, a sole source two-year agreement with Chicago Communications for the purchase of 35 truck-mounted two-way radios. 12 mobile two-way radios, 47 mounting brackets, the corresponding operating system, and a two-year service agreement in the amount of $55,276.88. Uh, funding is coming from uh, the Capital Improvement Fund uh, 2021 uh, General Obligation Bonds, uh, which has a $50,000 budgeted amount in 2021. Uh, the remaining $5,276.88 uh, is provided by the General Fund Street Division Minor Tools and Equipment Account, and that's for action. Uh, item A6, approval of purchase order increase for martial arts instruction at the Levy Center. Staff recommends City Council authorize the City Manager to approve the increase in the purchase order by $20,000. Uh, this is for Connolly's Academy to continue martial arts instruction uh, through the end of the calendar year. Uh, this is in the dollar amount of $53,970. Thank you, Councilmember Braithwaite, uh, which will be offset in uh, revenue uh, coming in to that account. Um, that is also for action. And then last is item A7, approval of contract award with Motorola Solutions for fire radio infrastructure upgrade. Staff recommends City Council authorize the City Manager to approve the sole source purchase with Motorola Solutions 
for upgrades to the fire radio system infrastructure in the amount of $678,627.44. Funding uh, will come from the uh, fiscal year 2022 uh, E911 fund budget, which has a budget amount of $450,000. Maintenance expenses will be funded from the uh, 2022 E911 fund budget services agreements contracts account, which has a budget of $335,000. All right, that was moved. The consent agenda was moved by Council Member Newsom. Is there a second? Second. All right, can we get a vote? Council Member Braithwaite. Councilmember Newsma. Aye. Councilmember Burns. Aye. Councilmember Reed. Aye. Councilmember Kelly. Aye. All right. Uh, A2. Approval of a contract with Tesca Associates for consulting services related to the Everson Skate Park. Uh, can someone move that? Is there a second? I'll second. All right. Discussion? Councilmember Kelly. So I just wanted to open the discussion a little bit more about. Um, I've read a lot from the um, from the Evanston Skates group and others about the importance of. And I'm forgetting the term right now. I apologize, but um, I think we discussed this before. Um, when you the contractors that do both design and build, I think it's called design build. And c can someone elaborate as to? this firm with regard to design build because I know the one that was referenced in um, a nearby suburb it turned out it really wasn't design build that it was called design build but it turned out in fact upon further research it was the one that staff was referencing um, was not in fact I think was a Deerfield anyway thank you Laura if you could um, talk because I know I know this makes all the difference in the world and skate parks we don't want to invest all this money and have there be you know have flaws later so Sure. My name is Laura Biggs. I'm city engineer. So uh, design build is a different type of procurement method where uh, you hire one team, which usually consists of a, the engineering or architecture firm and a contractor, and that one team carries you through the whole process of from beginning concept all the way to having everything completely constructed. So it is an appropriate method for building some things, but it doesn't work quite as well for others. And one of the things that it's really, really good for, for example, is if you want to compress the schedule, you can hire one team and you can make a decision, um, like let's say I want to build a restaurant and I want the restaurant to be exactly this size and in this location, they can pour the foundations and start building the walls before I've made decisions about what kind of tables to buy and things like that. So you can really, uh, compress the schedule that way, but it's not so good for some other things. So if you don't know exactly what it is you're building at the time you hire the team, you start giving up your options for making choices. So if I just want a skate park and I'm not too specific about exactly what it looks like or um, exactly what features there are in there, how it's oriented on the park, what does the landscaping look like when we're done, then we can, it's, it's better, you can hire a, just a team and they can start doing stuff while you're making these choices. But once you hire them, if you choose something different than what they assumed in their price, then it's a cost increase. So you're constantly giving up your control to make further choices. This is going to be something that goes through a really stringent public education, public education engagement process. And we feel like that process would start to be short-circuited if we hired a design bill, if we went through a design bill procurement process. We feel it's better to really give the community the opportunity to fully vet all of the choices, make all the decisions, and then when we're absolutely sure what we want, then we hire a contractor through a competitive cost process. Councilman Kelly, you still have the floor. Um, and I think um, Councilmember Burns and maybe even Newsma, right? You've had some, they've sent the videos. I think they've gone to great lengths to educate us about the skate community, about the importance of a design build contractor. 
So I'd love to hear from others here who I believe were also um, were shared with some of that information. And I don't think my understanding is that there have been a lot of very, very serious flaws um, in other skate parks where they've almost been rendered almost useless because of the separate contracting with design and build. So, but I believe other council members up here also have engaged with the skate community. I also feel strongly that we should have a um, subcommittee of APNW, um, a, skate a skate park subcommittee of APNW to really work hand in hand with staff um, as we go forward to ensure that we get this right. Uh, Councilmember Newsom. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Burns. I've had a, a conversation with uh, the skater folks that I know, and they are pleased with the direction this is heading. Uh, as I understand it, the, the technical difficulty, the technical challenge is that uh, you don't just want any old concrete contractor doing skate parks. Somebody who's good at sidewalks and curbs may not have the technical capabilities to do the smooth uh, transitions and the graceful curves of a skate park. Uh, and so that is, uh, you know, that's the crux of the matter here. Um, as I understand it, there is a, 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 um, a skate a specialist company involved as a subcontractor in this bid. You know, presumably they would be one of the bidders on the construction phase as well. Uh, so we will, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. You know, the construction project, the construction RFP has to be competitive to ensure we're getting the best price. Uh, but we'll make sure throughout this process that in the design phase, we are setting the specifications and, and te the technical specs and criteria for the contractor that the ultimate uh, selection uh, will be limited to those companies who are capable of doing that job. The staff is actually considering two different procurement methods for construction at this time to deal with some of the concerns that uh, the two of you have brought up. And the first would be to do a request for qualifications and sort of pre-qualify contractors. So we would solicit from people their qualifications to build skate parks. And if they wanted to bid, they would give us their qualifications. We'd say, out of all the people that submitted, four of these people are qualified to build skate parks, and then we would just ask for bids from those people. The other way is to go through a request for proposal process to hire the contractor so that you really get an opportunity to evaluate their qualifications and their strength as skate park construction people. So those are two ways. There's several others. Those seem the most expedient in terms of being able to move the project forward at this time and get a qualified contractor for this. So, it is a really specialty construction. And we're well aware that it's not the cheapest price that we, is going to get this job done satisfactorily. I suspect not, but I feel comfortable that if we are given an opportunity to choose based with heavy weighting on qualifications, we can still get a competitive price. Thank you. Any other questions, Councilmember Kelly? Um, Sorry, would it be possible to um, amend this uh, to um, <clears throat> call for a subcommittee of APNW in conjunction with this um, to ensure that we have the state community fully involved with this process? I would just like to make one comment related to that. Um, typically we have a strategic advisory committee and it is not uncommon for two aldermen to be on a strategic advisory committee associated with the project. And so you could already have people associated with APW be on the committee. It's almost always a given that one of the aldermen is going to be the ward alderman that's associated with the project and that alderman is sitting on the APW committee. Right, so I, I think that's important. I think it's also a way to expedite it because you don't have to go through the selection process. So I think that's fine, but um, but I would want to ensure if we have that, I would like to have that subcommittee and whoever would be, if this is a fifth ward, we're looking at fifth ward, right, for this um, skate park, then I would assume it would be Council Member Burns. I would expect um, to be working hand in hand with the skate community. I am concerned. I've read now a lot of material that they've sent me that we're not proceeding in the way that is recommended by skaters, so I am concerned. So I, in order to go forward on this, I would want to know that there is a committee that's working hand in hand um, with the expertise and experience for the very community we're serving. So, uh, so um, 
I would also I don't I don't think we need um I, I wouldn't be support of a of a subcommittee of AMPW. I would like to see, and I communicated this to you, Laura, the strategic committee that you just described. I would like to see that. Um, I, I do want to re report out that there were two members of the skate group. I can't recall the exact name of the skate skate group that were um, that were on the the RFP committee that selected this firm. Now, again, I don't know how the vote shaped out, but initially that's really what I fo wanted to focus on. It's one thing to have an advisory role, but I felt like to actually have a seat at the table and a vote was was even more important and powerful at this early stage. So we've, we've accomplished that, again, not knowing how the votes uh, went, but um, but they there were two members from the skate park who actually had a vote. They had that level of involvement. Um, but but I've talked to, to Laura and, and I, I thought we were on the same page that we would have a strategic you know, committee that worked on an ongoing basis with 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 our committee as well as staff. So, I would I would still like to see that, uh, Councilmember Kelly. Great. So, can we just confirm that? Otherwise, I'm uncomfortable going forward. Again, given the the amount of information and material and literature I've received on this, um, I understand that there was some involvement at the RFP process. But I'd like to know that there is this committee, including members of whether it's um, Councilmember Burns who is uh, maintaining close contact. With the skate community to ensure that we don't, and you know, build a skate from you know, re just reading about too many examples of expensive skate parks that were built because they weren't done with a design build firm. I just want to <laughs> ensure that um, this proceeds appropriately and that it's successful for our skate community. It's very exciting. So I would, I guess, I don't know how can we get some assurance or can we attach that to this? Do we just have a timeline of when we think we can get the committee seated? I, I know I heard from the skate park community they're ready. You know, we might have to identify some other members, but. We we had hoped that um, it will, t if this is approved tonight, it will take a couple of weeks to get it in under contract, during which time we should be determining who the strategic advisory committee is going to be, which would typically be a member of the neighborhoods, members of the local skating club, uh, or whatever the stakeholder groups are, and then one or two aldermen. So we would be working on that over the next two to three weeks, so that when we had the kickoff meeting with the contra or the the consultant, we would already be ready to start scheduling meetings with the strategic advisory committee. Councilmember Kelly. Yep. So the strategic advisory committee is something that would be happening anyway. We don't need any further action from yes. the dais. At this point, it uh, happens on pretty much all major projects that I think we're ready to vote. Our citywide projects. You have the floor. So, the strategic committee, which would be formed from with one or two members of APW or or city council, it it would not be a subcommittee of APW. Correct. Yeah, it's a stakeholder group, so th there could be neighbors who have, you know, property or homes or near the near the uh, the proposed skate park uh, site. That doesn't um, sound like it has lots of Council members, teeth in it. skate park community, you know. So it's a it's a good group of a good stakeholder group from the community. So I, I personally think we have we might have too many committees. I personally wouldn't support another committee that needs to be. We have to appoint different members, and we already have a. A fine process to get okay. I'm folks just involved. concerned that this, and I think the we've already committee, but you're talking about a committee. I'm just talking about the difference of a committee that has teeth versus one that sounds like it might not. Well, we're doing some. Uh, Councilman Reed and I, in fact, are doing uh, doing some work on my earlier referral to look at our how we do BCCs, and none of them really have teeth. Most of our committees are advisory, as well as the subcommittees are advisory. The, you know, the council makes the, the has the final say. So, none of our committees, for the most part, have teeth. Um, and uh, so they're all advisory, and we have to 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 give them teeth. We have to do something separate. But in terms of this process, I think we've already shown good faith that we've put two of their members on the RFP committee, and um, we have a timeline. From what I heard before, the can you provide that one more time? Before this, the person that we're approving today, the company we're approving today, is um, officially starts to work on this. We'll have the committee. Uh, members seated already. It, What's it takes approximately three weeks after a contract's awarded before we actually get all of the paperwork completed and schedule a kickoff meeting. And um, so during that time period, we would be forming 
the Strategic Advisory Committee, so over the next three weeks or so, so that when we have the kickoff meeting with the consultant, we're ready to start scheduling meetings with the Advisory Committee as well. Yeah, so if things change, we can revisit, but I think we're, we're ready for a vote. So, I'm sorry, but Councilmember yep. Burns, will you form that committee? I think staff will work to form the committee. So we, yeah, committee? we've talked about it before. Uh, Laura's in contact with the skate park group. Um, she can reach out to them. I think it's important that the representative elected official be at the helm of forming that strategic committee. I've participated already, and I'll continue to to the extent needed. The, count, okay. the council members involved on the committee are involved in making sure that the people on the committee are representative. So the, the committee is approved by the, me, the council members that are on the committee. And the skate park community will be well represented. I, I think where I can help is making sure the neighbors are also as equally represented on the council as well as we have a younger younger members, younger voice of the skate community, because I think that's where this, the concern started. There were young people skating downtown near, near Fountain Square, and we need to, in fact, revisit that. Like, that was, that's also a group that we need to make sure is, is going to travel to this skate park and use it. So uh, I think that's where I can help. Um, okay, can we, uh, it's been moved, seconded. Can we get a vote? It's been moved, right, properly moved? Okay, can we get a vote on this? Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. Um, we uh, have a, some public comments. We weren't sure if there was public comment, but I see there may have been, so I want to quickly allow, I think it was Mike Vasilko, to provide a public comment if he is available. And then there's one other person whose name we can't quite make out, but are there any public comments? Is Mike in the room? Okay, going once, going twice. Okay. Um, we are on to items for consideration. Uh, can someone move A8? Mr. Chair, I'll move item A8, resolution 91R21, allocating $850,000 in ARPA funding to the 2021 equipment replacement. Second. All right, any discussion? Councilmember Kelly. Um, let's see, would that be Mr. Stonebeck? Could, is this, or who? Um, Hitesh is available. Okay, so where I just am, just wanted some, like where would we see the, I don't mean to say anything, but evidence that we need to reap this amount in replacement for next year, that this all has to happen next year? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair and the members of the Administration Public Works Committee. So what we are talking about resolution is for 2020 fund and not 2022. Uh, these were the, approved by the city council last year. Um, it was originally supposed to be coming out of the GEO bonds for 2020. Once we realized that we will get the money in early this year, in the month of March, uh, we decided to borrow less to reduce the debt service and instead go uh, with the ARPA fund use uh, and the administrative service, the uh, fleet service. Uh, they have already purchased the vehicle. Uh, the fund is running roughly 800,000 deficit right now. Uh, so we really need uh, these funds uh, to kind of bring them back into the positive territory. Councilman Kelly. So this is just about maintaining the fund, but not we don't have any um, immediate needs for actual equipment replacement? We no, just the equipment have already been purchased this year, Councilmember Kelly. Uh, so, and if you talk, look at the fund bill and last year, the 2020, the equipment replacement ended the fund with the 539,000 of the fund balance. That's already gone. It's wiped out because we are running 
a deficit of 800,000 so far this year because they have already purchased the vehicles which were approved by the council last year. So we need the fund at least to bring the 2020 equipment replacement fund to a positive territory. This is not for 2022. This is just for 2021. I understand. Uh, we have uh, Sean Cholik, facilities and fleet manager. Good afternoon, chair and members of the committee. Um, Sean Cholik, facilities and fleet manager. Uh, just to clarify, so as Hitesh said, all of these vehicles have already been ordered approved and ordered uh, for the 2021 uh, uh, equipment replacement fund. A lot of these vehicles have a long lead time to them. Um, it, it takes uh, sometimes over a year to get the order in, to get the, the vehicle specified, to get the order in, and to get the vehicles uh, in production so that they come to us in the, uh, the following year. So. For example, right now we are we, we do have a number of uh, a large number of equipment uh, vehicles and equipment that need to be replaced in 2022. So we've currently been working on those specifications, bringing those approvals to council, um, getting getting those approvals and moving forward with those orders. So um, you know everything that we're ordering for for equipments in the fleet, that's all done the the the, the year before, even a little bit before that. So so that there's time to manufacture and produce these vehicles. Okay, so this is, this 850,000 um, is to cover the cost of vehicles ordered this year? That, that were already ordered for this year. So a lot of them have either come in or they are on their way in. Um, they, they've been approved already for 2021. And originally that was gonna be paid for through? Geopods. The originally council member Kelly, the council originally said that, okay, we they first reduced the overall equipment replacement fund budget last year. And then they say, instead of transferring from general fund, thereby increasing the tax levy, they say, why don't you issue the bond next year? And when we got the news about the ARPA funds, uh, we decided to borrow less by that 850 and instead the ARPA funds for that. Thank you. All right, A8, uh, resolution allocating 850000 in ARPA funding to 2021 equipment replacements has been properly moved and seconded. No vote. Councilmember Burns? Uh, aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. All right, A9, can someone move A9? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, yeah. I'd like to move item A9 resolution. A9 is the one that's not. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, scratch that. We don't need to move A9. Sorry, Council Member Braithway. That was held at City That was held at uh, a previous AMPW meeting, I believe September 13th. It was held, or I'm sorry, it was moved uh, along the City Council. So we are uh, A10. Can someone move A10? Yes. Go ahead and move that. Item A10 uh, is resolution 120-R-21, authorizing the interim city manager to execute an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Evanston and Evanston Skokie School District 65 regarding the fifth, five fifth uh, tax increment finance district. Just for action. Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion. Councilmember Kelly. Um, yeah, so I do have some concerns about the IGA. I actually was asking to see it throughout the process. Um, I think it is important that this is such an enormous um, undertaking, um, this this TIF, and I, I wish we this had been shared with us throughout the process. But at any rate, I am concerned with some aspects to it. I'm, I mean, we're talking about, I mean, the city really doesn't have any education expertise. And so I am concerned that it really doesn't have business within this IGA of telling a district, you know, what it has to do with its facilities. And, and to the point where I'm, um, I feel like a local government such as a district should not be contracting away public policy. I mean, where this like bypassing a potential referendum and therefore bypassing the public, 
Um, it seems like this is this flies in the face of public policy, and it just I, I'm curious. This, I'm I'm not really convinced that this isn't outright like void. I don't um, for a city to mandate what a school district has to do regarding a school. I'm very favorable of a fifth ward school. I always have been, but I'm concerned that this is part of the IGA. I don't see how a city with where the expertise is with the school districts would be telling a school district what to do. And I, I guess I would like to see, I mean, I would like to see some um, a legal um, explanation of this, not necessarily from, I'd like to hold this until we have actual um, legal expertise regarding this. I don't see how we can bypass how a city can, can in fact, mandate to a school district what it's supposed to do with its facilities. Um, and just quickly to answer it, so uh, the district has already publicly committed to build a school in the fifth ward without a referendum. And so as we were looking for considerations on their end that they could commit to, um, we, we pulled that out as something that we thought was easy enough because they had already publicly committed to doing it. Uh, Council Member, or, I'm sorry, Council Member Kelly, are you yeah, I just like the, the provision requires um, in the in the IG it requires the fifth ward school it requires the district C five build a fifth ward school. I'm not convinced that legally this is appropriate that we can do this legally. And I just I, I would like um, a legal analysis of this in terms of bypassing for a city to require this of a school district. I just it says it says they're going to make a good faith effort. And that language was selected with acknowledging that they are engaged in a process to determine whether or not the their constituency would like to see a fifth a school in the fifth ward. And so it said we'll make a good faith effort, but the district has acknowledged, we've acknowledged that they're going through a, a community input feedback process to determine what type of school, if there will be a school, where, et cetera. So it says good faith effort. So there's language uh, included that allows them um, the flexibility that I think you're concerned they may not have. That being said, again, this is a commitment. I want to repeat, this is a commitment they already publicly made. No, I understand that, right. and, so, and I appreciate the effort. I, I just am concerned that nevertheless that is part of the um, agreement, the city requiring or you know saying that they they must make a good faith whatever you want to call it requiring making good faith effort of the educational institution and that concerns me that i i don't think that's in the city's purview council member Nusma. thank you chair burns um yeah as i read the uh section 4a that council member kelly is bumping on and it does read to me uh, is somewhat non-binding in that we're only requiring or only asking the school district to make a good faith effort. Um, but having said that, I share Council Member Kelly's concerns that, uh, you know, the city seems to be getting in the school district's business. And also the flip side, that the school district is getting up in the city's business. Uh, you know, by the same token, and we can also argue that it's not the uh, business of the um, of the school board of district 65 to weigh in on economic development or uh, affordable housing even though we may ultimately agree on uh, the objective uh, the city is in charge of uh, economic policy and, and affordable housing policy school district is in charge of what the school district is in charge of so i am uh, honestly uh, a little bit uncomfortable with this iga for those reasons however um, I agreed to uh, to put a pause on the process last time we met on this topic so that the district and the city could uh, work out an agreement and, and come together on something that is really important uh, for the community. And for something like this, uh, to have the district and the city at odds with each other doesn't do anybody any good, since we are ultimately responsible to the same voters. Uh, we all serve the same bosses here. Uh, and so that process did play out. Uh, the IGA was uh, was negotiated uh, between representatives of the city, representatives of the school district, and 
uh, I thank them for devoting that time and, and energy into that process and from both sides uh, of the negotiating table doing so in good faith and coming up with this agreement, which although I, I'm uncomfortable with for the reasons I've stated, ultimately I think this is the right thing to do. Uh, it essentially just replicates what's already in our uh, self-imposed resolution, uh, which ideally, in my opinion, is the only place it should be. But uh, in order to uh, you know, maintain an amicable relations between the city and the school district, if we have to have an IGA that kind of serves as, uh, as suspenders when we already have a belt, I'm comfortable with it. Um, I do have some. I like that. I do have some uh, minor objections in that the language of the IGA does not precisely match the language of the resolution. And in terms of, uh, of um, transparency, I don't think that serves us as well as the community should be served. And what I'm thinking of is not the people on this council, not the people on, on this school board, but 17 and a half years down the line when somebody else is trying to research what happened with this ordinance. You'll look up a resolution, you'll look up the ordinance, you'll look up the council packet, and uh, nowhere in there, uh, it's gonna be hard to find the, uh, the IGA unless you know what you're looking for. So ideally, uh, I would like to see the resolution, which we're uh, gonna talk about at council, uh, match the language that's in this IGA. Councilmember Braithley. So, I mean, the documents have been published and hopefully you've had an opportunity to read it. Uh, I am a huge fan of using TIF districts, as we have two in the second ward, as an economic development tool. I've, I've shared that publicly and to the people who've written to me. I'm, I'm willing to support moving forward only because this document is vague enough that it will serve as an instrument to hopefully educate and provide conversation around the topic as we move forward. So if we don't have it in place, then there's really no conversation. Um, so Council Member Kel, I guess if there's something specific in the document, I mean, it's a short read. I, I don't know if you're gonna, there are enough votes to move it to Council. I would suggest maybe you highlight the areas that you have concern between now and Council, and then we can debate that. But to try to have a legal analysis of whole document that's published, I don't think is very realistic. And, um, but again, if there's something specific between now and Council, I'd be willing to hear, and that would be the direction that I would advise. Thank you. Council Member Kelly. Yeah, so, you know, when I tabled the TIF, um, I really wanted to, my intention was, as I stated about, you know, three weeks ago or a month ago, was to allow time to craft this IGA. And I was told by um, Chief Corporation Counsel Cummings that it had to be to a date certain. Well, I, from everything I learned afterwards, and I'm, you know, re new to this, um, it really didn't have to be. And so I w we were forced to set this date, and I feel like this was done under pressure um, because we, I was, told I had to set a date certain, and when I looked at tabling, in fact, you don't. It's left, and I looked through our, unless I missed something, I went through um, our rules, I went through Robert's rules, I talked to parliamentarians. So I just wanna say, I feel like this was um, forced, um, it was rushed, and I would like to, yeah. Um. Councilman Kelly, before yeah. you finish, I just want to say that um, so both sides have been working on this before it was tabled, and they've we've reached an agreement. Those are the facts. So no matter how long it took, mm -hmm. we've reached an agreement. Okay. So is there anything specific that? I, I just feel like it was rushed. I would like to it to have been able to evolve. Um, I feel like some of these, some of it, to to Councilmember Newsmith's point, also I think that this could be crafted um, far better to ensure that um, neither 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 entity is treading on the other and that we're not, you know, that the, in particular as an educator that the city is not um, imposing 
on the district's um, educational expertise I mean, in, is there in anything making requirements. specific in the document that the post and again we have time between now and we have time between now and council to and it's an IGA we have to impose on one another that's the nature of intergovernmental agreements we have to so what is commit the, the other to something okay and can right. you and I'll find this the portion right now but and also can you is the financial piece has that been um, I know you have this piece regarding, you know, the affordable housing, and I don't know if you did iron out, like the AMI, I heard that that was still up in the air in terms of what you were considering the affordable housing, who the affordable housing would serve. Did that get ironed out? So it's, it's, it's in the, uh, you want to talk about that, that, that piece, and then we're going to move on, because it is, it is in the, it's all there. It's in the IGA that you received in your packet. But right. if you so can speak specifically, council comments. Right. That's not identified. To, um, it is. Can you speak quickly to the affordable housing piece, and then we're going to move on. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Chair Burns, uh, Nicholas Cummings Coalition Council. So the TIF Act specifically requires that uh, if the city, if there is a development, residential development project that involves affordable housing, the city can use TIF funds for up to half of the cost to the developer to develop those funds, or I'm sorry, to develop those units. Um, the state sets the, the, the AMI level and it's 80% or lower. That's actually in state code. And so it's referenced in the IGA instead of spelling it all out, but we reference the TIF Act, which then references, uh, I forget the name of the, the, the statute right now, but it references the, the levels of very low and low income and after further research, it's basically 80% of AMI or lower. Okay. And I mean, could we not tie it to our own IHO instead? That was that was under discussion, but the problem is, again, the, the TIF Act outlines what we can actually use TIF funds for if there is a, a reimbursement to a developer for development of affordable housing. So the TIF Act would not allow us to um, designate affordable housing in, ali in alignment with our own IHO? Uh, only if it was, I guess, more strict, um, okay. it might be allowable. However, um, generally speaking, the tax incremental finance law is not one of those in which uh, we're, we've given a lot of flexibility in terms of our home rule authority. So it was negotiated that we would just follow the TIF Act. Um, it was discussed that we would likely use our own inclusionary housing ordinance. Um, but those discussions, once they occurred, became simpler to say, we'll follow the TIF Act. And there is a mention, Council Cummins, to also follow in all current and future ordinances related to affordable housing. So we're, we're going to embark on an affordable housing plan and process in the next few weeks and months, and so there is a mentioned in the IGA that we will follow our ordinances related to affordable housing. So as those goals and objectives and and l different levels are established, we will follow them. Right, but it would have to be, I mean, I, I would be much more comfortable if it was following our IHO because 80%, as we know, is not you know necessarily going to serve the affordable housing needs of our city. Um, so... Council, Council Member Kelly, if I may. Yeah. Um, the way that the TIF Act requires us to, to use the funds allows us to reimburse a developer for the units that are developed that are affordable housing, affordable housing being a term of art. However, the city council can still use TIF dollars to support other costs of other development that might address something greater than 80% AMI or something else that might address what, you know, Sarah Flax and, and others would call the missing middle, um, which is essentially very, very, it's, like, it's a huge gap here in Evanston of, in terms of available housing to those that can afford the half million dollar homes, which is the average home price, and those that are considered quote unquote affordable housing, again, as a term of art that the federal government and the state government uses. Right, but we can certainly have in our TIF um, ordinance <clears throat> the intention to serve folks at 60% or lower. I mean, we can certainly put that in. It's a choice not to. So, I mean, it's included at that at that level but what I, I guess what I'm saying is that the TIF funds can only be used based upon what the state says well, we can use TIF the city can use TIF funds to fund other 
portions of that development, not necessarily the residential development. I that understand that there's just simply no guarantee of it at all if it's not written into the ordinance. <clears throat> if I can uh, jump in, right, when Council Member Kelly's done. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Council Member Reed. Yeah, uh, to, to, I mean, I think to just clarify what Council Member, uh, you know, the, the question that Council Member Kelly has is, Sure. If our ordinance is more strict, we can we can do that. Uh, the, as far as a guarantee, I mean, the guarantee of an ordinance is no different than the guarantee of this body because any council can come and change an ordinance uh, down the road. And so uh, there isn't really. I, I think we're 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 right where we need to be. The the, the state statute uh, guarantees it has to be eighty percent or lower. Uh, this council and any other council can certainly. Uh, you know, go to that 60% to 30%, whatever it is, it's under the 80%. So that's well within bounds. So I think your, uh, your concern is addressed. Councilmember Kelly, any other, nothing else? Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's been properly moved, seconded. Can we have a vote? Councilmember Reed. Uh, aye. Councilmember Kelly? No. Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Okay. Um, A11 ordinance authorizing the city manager to execute a sale contract for city owned real property located at uh, 2022 and 20 through 2026 Central Street. Um, do I have a, a, would somebody like to move that or second? I'll second. Discussion? All right, seeing none. We'll need a roll call. This for action? Oh, this for introduction. This for the introduction? Yeah, we still need to move it though. All right. Go ahead and call. Council Member Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. All right, 812 also for introduction, uh, sale of surplus property, fleet equipment, vehicles owned by the city of Evanston. Can someone move it, please? Is there a second? I'll second. All right, discussion? Seeing none. Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. All right, 813, uh, ordinance amending the city code, uh, section 7-13-3 to decrease sewer user rates. Second. Let's get a move first. Get somebody move, motion, okay. Second. Anybody? I'll second. All right. Discussion, Councilmember Newsma. I do have some questions, uh, both for item A13 and A14, which kind of move in parallel uh, about how the the program for the LIHEAP eligible residents will be administered. Um, and I'll start by saying it's great that we are you know taking equity into account and you know providing a, a discounted rate to LIHEAP eligible customers. You know we're definitely headed in the right direction there. Um, and I understand it gets a little bit tricky when you have uh, customers who use water but don't pay the water bill directly because it's included in their rent. And so, uh, you know, as I understand it, uh, we will also be compensating uh, those customers who did not have to pay a water bill directly. Um, and so if it's uh, uh, Mr. Stonebeck or, or Lara, if one of you are available to answer some questions here about how we will administer that, how we'll track these people, and, and, and how much they're going to be compensated. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. Dave Stomach, Acting Deputy City Manager. Uh, to be qualified, the, the community members will have to provide us with a copy of the letter indicating that they were uh, accepted into LEHEAP. Once they do that, we will obtain their address and uh, phone numbers and contact information. If they own a home and they have a water meter, they will just be charged the uh, affordable rate. If they are renters, 
then what the city plans to do is to issue a payment, uh, which is the difference between the, the water rate and the affordable rate, and then assuming a usage of 115 uh, billing units, which is equivalent to 86,000 gallons, which is what the family of four uh, average usage would be. I mean, again, that's just average because there's a big span in there. So one question about the engagement. Does this means that in order to be eligible for this program, people need to be aware of it and apply. It's not an automatic type thing. That is correct. They will have to submit their letter of authorization from CETA indicating that they were accepted into the LEAD okay. Heat program. If this ordinance is passed, then staff will start a community uh, campaign, advertisement campaign to make uh, our community members aware of this program and ask them to submit their copy of their letter of authorization yeah. from uh, CETA. Is, is there any way that the, the city can get a list, or does the city have a list of LIHEAP? Uh, it may, oh, that actually, pardon me. So the if you haven't referred someone for HALIHEAP or applied yourself, can you explain to members of the committee and also the public, this might be a good informational just, what is LIHEAP, how it works, and then also where they can go to sign up for LIHEAP? Uh, sure, and uh, so it's Low Income Housing Home Energy Assistance Program. So if you have a pass-through bill for either uh, electric or for natural gas, you can qualify for this program. Uh, you have to submit through CETA. Uh, ComEd is making announcements out currently telling you how to uh, apply. Uh, applications were started to receive for the current year, CETA's current year as of September 1st. So some people could already be qualified and, and uh, be authorized for this, but you can continue to do that throughout the year as well. Uh, Evanston works on trying to make people aware of it. Uh, we have information that approximately 600 Evanston residents are already eligible, so they, you know, they've already applied in past years, so they're familiar with how to do it. Uh, I myself have never applied, so I don't know the specifics right. for it. So we don't have a list, but CEDAM has a list. And they are unwilling to share that with us. We made several attempts to try to get the list. We also made a request that Evanston would produce a letter so that they could send a letter out to the Evanston residents that qualify with the specific letters saying that this was available and they would not assist us in that manner either. So in terms of our vulnerable residents, council member, newsman, anyone else is lo that's listening. So most seniors, if you're having issues with your electric or, or nursing home, and if you're engaged with any agency that's a senior services, a majority of those workers are familiar with LIHEAP. Um, I've walked a few people through it. It's, it's, it's been a while, but it's a, it's a pretty straightforward form that you're providing your income and other documentation yeah. and then once you're on, I believe it's a annual true up. We used to have the services downstairs in the bottom through our North Shore Senior Center. Uh, CETA will be coming, moving back to to Evanston. So I can't say it's an absolute, but there's a, a large number of people. If you need assistance, we have the staff and the outreach to get this done. I think the most important thing about this bill is just the work on behalf of our staff. I want to credit you. Director Stonebeck and whoever else you've been working with to get this done, that we now have a tool in place. So once we vote it in action, then we can do a lot of outreach to get the our residents. That's yeah, the and that's, that's where my question yeah, is. Yeah. I understand the lobby yeah. process. I yeah. understand the, the. I don't know what the eligibility eligibility requirements are, but I understand the the concept. My question is, how can we get to the folks that will benefit from this program? It would seem that if CETA were at least willing to send a a letter to the folks that they know who are eligible, that would make our life a lot easier. And, that and we not tried very hard to have that happen. Yeah. We have yeah. That not being the case, it's on us that. to do that Pass outreach it. and yeah. make sure that our, our our constituents are aware of it. Yeah. So it just makes the city's job harder than it ideally should be. It is our outreach, and that will be the challenge, but we hope to go through all the aldermen's word emails. Uh, we'll go through the religious community as well. Uh, 
I've already spoken to Audrey Thompson several times about this, so she's well aware of it, and she will help get the word out as well. And we really hope to get a good outreach program going. And meanwhile, we can still try and uh, twist an elbow at CETA to see if they can work with us. We can try. I have <laughs> went up the chain pretty high. Okay. So. Uh, Council Member Reed. Yeah, I, I just uh, I, I want to double down on uh, Council Member Newsom's uh, line of inquiry. I really think uh, it sounds as though we really haven't yet figured out how we're going to do this with uh, our low-income residents. Uh, and uh, to be clear, I'm sorry. So this will only uh, the the rebate will only apply to uh, residents who um, have li LIHEAP, right? Am I hearing that correctly? This wouldn't apply to normal renters who aren't receiving assistance. That is correct. Uh, we would only make it uh, for community members that are LIHEAP qualified and our homeowners are, are folks who are homeowners seeing a reduction in their overall bill if they are lee qualified they would get a reduction in their bill we would charge them in a lower and, and i'm sorry when i say overall bill i mean uh both when you combine water and sewer correct so and, and a not a lie heap I mean, I mean just a you know regular evanstonian with a normal single family home no they would not received the the this affordable rate is only for community members that are lee qualified uh, no I, I, okay so i'm moving away somewhat from the affordable rate uh with the new chain with the change in the water rate and the sewer rate would an average homeowner see a reduction in their overall water sewer bill no they would not they'd see slightly okay. uh under a two percent rate increase uh which will be the first combined water and sewer rate increase since 2016. And uh, as provided in the packet, you can see that Evanston is still uh, well below, uh, well not, we're in the lower third of all the comparison communities. And actually that exhibit, exhibit two on page 256 of the, of the APW packet yes. Uh, indicates that it's the 2021 rate, and it should be, that is actually the 2022 rate, the proposed rate that we're showing there. It shows Evanston is still in the lower third of uh, okay. our communities. And then uh, my next uh, question is, um, oh, geez, it's slipped my mind. I'm not feeling too well. Uh, while you're thinking, uh, Councilman yeah, yeah, Reed, I, I do have another question as well. Uh, for those folks receiving the the uh, the cash rebate, uh, we are just kind of rounding off and assuming treating them all as a four person family that average that average rate, whether they're one or two or six or seven folks. That is correct. Yes, we we do not have the staff to get that far into the woods about how many people reside there and, and that type of information hmm. uh, and if you're a renter there's generally only one water meter going into the building and then there's no way of splitting it up between individual units within that building to determine their actual water usage so again we're just using the standard average understanding that it's not perfect we could try to make it perfecter but we'll never know and it wouldn't be worth the effort uh, it would cost a lot of money to try to put individual water meters in yeah. in, in all these apartments oh okay I, I do remember my question now so uh speaking of staff that was my question so you said that we uh what staff do you see being i mean as i'm looking at the budget and across the board it seems like our staff is fairly taxed so i'm i'm trying to understand what staff think you know capability or availability do you think we have to uh, do this outreach to ensure that folks know about this rebate uh well again we're what, good. one i guess what department would be who specifically what you know uh division or department would be handling this and then how many folks do you think it's going to take uh well the outreach would be headed by the water division of the public works agency so daryl king 
would be ultimately responsible for that, but we would in, uh, work with our community engagement uh, division to try to spread the word out, uh, go to ward meetings and uh, have the information out. There's also, a, a, through community engagement, they do have a newsletter that goes to the religious community, so we would go through there as well. And then again, we would use the resources that we have in Health and Human Services with Audrey uh, Thompson's group to try to spread the word as well. We uh, have already got permission through Lawrence Hemingway that the community members uh, want to bring a copy of their letter into the Levy Center or to the Fleetwood Jordan Center, that the staff there would uh, make a scanned copy of that letter and then email it to uh, uh, an email that would arrive at the water plant so that our billing clerk could then enter that into uh, our water billing system and keep track of it that way. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, one more question. LIHEAP eligibility, I assume, is by household rather than by individual. That is correct. Okay. Okay. All right, any other questions? All right, it's been probably moved and seconded. Can we get a vote, please? Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. A14 ordinance amending city code section 7-12-17 uh, to increase water charges and establish an affordable rate. This is for introduction. Can someone please move that a motion? I will make a motion on item A14. Second. All right, discussion? All right, seeing none, vote please. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. All right, seeing no other business, uh, we are adjourned.